So the title of my message today is simply this, The Practical Power of Hope. The Practical Power of Hope. And as I was thinking and praying about this message this week, because we're gonna be here next Sunday for just a moment of prayer before we head out, but this is my last sermon that I preached before sabbatical, and I thought, gosh, you know, you got kind of a short space here to preach on something. And I thought, man, it's a little bit of a shame I know we talk about the resurrection of Jesus a lot. I know we sing about it a lot. But it's kind of a shame that we only have one Sunday a year where we really like focus on it, and that's Easter Sunday. I mean, friends, this is the turning point in human history that we're talking about here. This is the most central belief of Christianity that Jesus rose from the dead. And so I thought, okay, let's hit that again. Anybody with me on that? Or y'all like, gosh, we heard about this last week, we're done. Just kidding. Hopefully not, okay? Hopefully y'all are ready for that. But here's the beauty of it, okay? We have to learn what it means to live life in light of the resurrection. What does this mean for us on a practical level? Not just for the, the salvation of our souls, but what does it mean for us in our everyday relationships, in our marriages, in our parenting, in our businesses, in our jobs, in our careers, in every aspect of our lives, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Our faith has been put in him, is resting in him. How does that affect how you make decisions? How does that affect what you worry about, what you stress about, where you find peace, where you look for significance in your life? Living in light of the resurrection has to inform everything about our lives. We are, as Christians, we are an Easter people. We are people that believe that what happened to Jesus when he overcame death is our destiny too. What happened to Jesus when he overcame death, when we put our faith in him, means that even though our physical bodies may one day die, when Jesus returns... This is the core of Christianity. When Jesus returns, we too will walk with him in new life, physical, bodily, resurrected life, never to die again. And so what are the practical implications and the power of that hope? How does that hope play out in our actual lives, the hope of what Jesus has done for us and the resurrection of the dead? So I wanna look at, this section from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and really we're going to go all the way through verse 8, because this is where Peter, this is amazing, he's writing this letter to the very first Christians who have ever believed in Jesus without seeing him. I want you to think about that for a second. If you're here today and you've put your faith in Christ, you've done that without seeing him. You haven't physically seen Jesus. You've heard the message of the gospel preached from God's word. You've put your faith that, hey, I believe that God became a man. His name was Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life, died on a cross for my sins, and then rose from the dead, conquering sin, death, and the grave. That's what we believe, but we've never seen Jesus. That's what faith is. He's writing to the first group of Christians that did not get the chance, like Doubting Thomas, who I talked about last week. They didn't get the chance to see Jesus. They didn't get the chance to physically touch the wounds in his hand or his side. They didn't get the chance to talk with Jesus on the road to Emmaus like some of the disciples did after he had risen from the dead. They didn't get the chance to eat breakfast by the sea with Jesus when he cooked the the boys some fish that one amazing morning after he was risen from the dead. They didn't get that opportunity. And so Peter is writing to them, and they're facing trials. They're, fa- they're up against it. They've never seen Jesus. They've heard the hope of the gospel. They've realized, they've been filled with the Holy Spirit. They realized this message is the hope of the world. This is what the world needs. And they've put their faith in him, but now their faith is being tested. Their hope is being tested. So the question is this, what will they anchor their hope and their faith to in the midst of trials? After Jesus has risen from the dead, after Easter has happened, how will they live their lives? That's what Peter is getting into. And he starts with this, 
All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy, his love for us, that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ, he raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. The other translations use the word living hope. Now we live with a living hope, a living hope. We're gonna get to that in a second. I wanna look right here first at this phrase, born again. One of the things that you will hear if you're new to church or maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a while, is this idea of being raised to new life. And if you're new to Christianity, if you're exploring the claims of Christianity, that might be confusing for you. You might be thinking right now, Pastor, what do you mean new life? What do you mean raised from death to life? I'm sitting here breathing right now. I'm pretty sure I'm alive right now. What do you mean, do I need new life? What does that mean, right? And sometimes we can breeze over the most fundamental truths of Christianity, but we gotta pause and sit there for just a second because when the Bible, when, when Peter is talking about being born again, we know that birth is the beginning of life. Birth is the beginning of your and my physical existence on this planet. What Peter is saying is when you put your faith in Jesus, you are born again spiritually. That's the beginning of your spiritual life. That's the beginning of your eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. That is a new beginning. You're born again. So the beauty of Easter, the beauty of Jesus being risen from the dead and us putting our faith in him means this. You have a new beginning spiritually. There's a beginning, a beginning of a whole new story that God is writing in your life. That's what salvation is. It is the beginning of God saying, hey, I have rescued you, redeemed you, and now I'm setting you on a new course. You've been born again. It's a new beginning because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's where our new beginning starts. Now we live with great expectation, with living hope. Now friends, I don't know about you, but if you're breathing on this planet, you know what it feels like when hope dies. You know what it feels like when you've put your hope in something, in anything, and that hope did not turn out the way you hoped it would. That thing did not turn out the way that you hoped it would. Whatever you were expecting or dreaming of or looking at for your future could be anything. Could have been a relationship you hoped was gonna work out in a certain way. Could have been a marriage that you hoped was going to work out in a certain way. Excuse me. It could have been anything, whether it's with your children, your career, the companies that you have, all the different things in our own lives that we have hoped and dreamed would work out in a particular way that did not end up the way that we hoped they would. We know what it feels like when hope dies. And here's the amazing thing that Peter is saying. No matter what you have put your hope in in the past, and it's okay to have hopes and dreams for your future. In fact, it's essential as humans to have hopes and dreams for your future. The thing is this, what are you putting your hope in? If there's anything in this earth that you're putting your hope in, ultimately, that is not Jesus Christ, it's not anchored in Jesus Christ being raised from the dead, then you will be let down. Then at some point, that hope may not become what you hoped it would be. And so friends, a living hope is simply this. It is anchoring your hope for the future. It's anchoring your faith in something that is not dictated by the circumstances of your life. It's not dependent on the storms or the trials that you're facing today. Your hope is anchored to something that is secure, to something that is unfading, which Peter is gonna talk about in just a second. It's anchored to something beyond the negative influence or the fearful impact of what happens in this world. That's the hope of the resurrection. That's where we anchor our hope. Friends, this word expectation, right? I thought about this. Our expectations are neutral, right? 
They're kind of like this neutral party. We all have expectations for the future. They can be either good expectations or fearful expectations. We can look to the future and we can have expectations that are filled with goodness and hope and positivity, or we can look to the future and have fear, negative expectations. And maybe these expectations, they're being influenced by the storm that you're in right now. Maybe they're being influenced by your past experience. Maybe these expectations are being affected by emotions, feelings, by your current health, by whatever you're going through in life, your expectations might be getting hijacked by those circumstances. And what Peter is saying is, hey, I want you to expect ultimate good for your life. He's not saying that you're not gonna face storms. He's not saying that some of the hopes that you're hoping for and dreams that you're hoping for aren't going, he's not saying all of those things are going to come to fruition in exactly the way you hoped they would. Some of those things, you're gonna hit the wall. Some of those things are gonna die. Some of the circumstances are gonna change and you're gonna have to pivot. But he's saying this, ultimately, if your hope is anchored in Christ, If your hope is anchored in the story that God is writing for your life, then even if your current hopes and dreams die, the things that you had been holding on to and hoping for, even if those don't turn out the way you thought they would, in the end, in the ultimate end, God is not finished writing the story of your life and your hope can be anchored to Christ so your hope can pivot and say, okay, that didn't turn out the way I thought it was, but that's not my ultimate identity. Friends, a living hope is both flexible and resilient. It's flexible and resilient, which means when you put your hope in something, when you went after a dream, when you went after a relationship and you really hoped it was gonna be the one, but it didn't work out, when you went after fill in the blank, and it didn't happen, it fell apart, life happened, tragedy struck, something that you weren't expecting happened, when all of that falls apart and at some point in your life, something is not going to turn out the way you hoped it will. When that happens, a living hope is flexible enough to say, okay, I can let that go. I can actually release that to God because I know my my hope is not ultimately anchored in that. It's not ultimately dependent on whether that thing turned out the way I hoped it would. It's dependent and anchored on Christ, on the fact that he rose from the dead and that he's ultimately in charge of the, the eternal picture, the eternal story that's being written with my life. So it can pivot, it can change, it can hold on to things and release things, it can dream again. It never stays down forever because it's anchored to the one who did not stay in the grave, amen? It's also resilient, and here's why it's resilient. Peter goes on in the next verse, he says, we have a priceless inheritance, This is why hope is resilient. Peter is completely unashamed about using a metaphor, an illustration right here, that all of us can relate to. Every single one of us can relate to this, okay? Just imagine, okay, for a moment that your great-great-uncle died unexpectedly, or your great-uncle, someone you never knew, and somebody shows up with a check at your house one day. This is what Peter's saying, a priceless inheritance. And I don't know, let's say uh, your uncle's name was Jeff Bezos. We'll just start there. I don't know, Elon Musk. And uh, this guy shows up at your door and is like, hey, um, you know, they uh, have left you a priceless inheritance. Like put a price on it. Here's a blank check, write it, whatever you want. It's priceless, it's it's like more money than you can imagine, more money than anyone else in the world has. Go ahead, just write it in. Your inheritance now for the rest of your life, okay? I'm sorry, but let's just be real for a second. 
Whatever storm you're facing in life at that moment, whatever trial you're facing in life at that moment, Peter is unashamedly saying, just imagine that a priceless inheritance showed up for you. That's gonna drastically change your view on your current circumstances. It's not gonna solve all your problems. Money never will, but let's be real. It'll solve some of them. Come on, somebody. We're in church. We'll be honest, right? It'll solve some of them, right? This inheritance, though, is even better than that. It's even better than that. It's an inheritance kept in heaven for you, pure, undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. This inheritance is eternal, it's beyond anything you can ask or imagine. The same way you would feel if something tangible, like a blank check, fell in your lap that was beyond any number in your mind. The same way that you would feel about that. Which, let's be real, you would be like, wow, this is amazing. This is gonna change my life and all the generations of my family. The same way you would feel about that, this is gonna blow your mind beyond that. Beyond that, okay? which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Friends, this inheritance kept in heaven is beyond the reach of decay. Anything finite, even, even the wealth of the wealthiest people is not beyond the reach of tragedy. Anything finite on this earth is within the reach of decay or falling apart. It's part of my own family story. My great-great-grandfather, Humphrey Finney, that's his name. <laughs> what a name, legendary name, right? Humphrey Finney, he was, he was in the thoroughbred business. He was a first-generation immigrant from England. He came over to America, moved to Kentucky, where he started what became one of the largest thoroughbred sales companies in the world, in the world. The guy had an unbelievable knack for picking a winning horse and he knew how to, how to breed and train horses in a way where through, he started something called Phasic Tipton Sales, which later got purchased by Churchill Downs, which runs the Kentucky Derby. But at the end of the day, he was so good at picking horses. He picked multiple, multiple Triple Crown winners and multiple Derby winners. And they were all sold through Phasic Tipton and their bloodlines were held by Phasic Tipton. It's this incredible, incredible thing. Um, I have zero inheritance from that. <laughs> zero, okay? <laughs> because it was not beyond the reach of change and decay. And the change came in the form of multiple huge dramatic family divorces on that side. All sorts of lawsuits had happened. And after Humphrey died, it was passed on and separated onto three or four of his kids. And over time, the whole thing fell apart until it was sold for pennies on the dollar to Churchill Downs. For almost nothing, it couldn't even pay its way out of its own debts. So we didn't inherit anything except debt, <laughs> which thankfully we didn't have to pay that. But that's the reality when we're talking about salvation and something eternal, that Peter is saying what is waiting for you, the truth of your salvation is beyond. It's more priceless than that. It's beyond change or decay. And this salvation is beyond anything you can imagine. It's more precious than a priceless inheritance. And he goes on, so be truly glad. Even though you've never seen Jesus, even though you're facing trials, even though you're up against it, even though the things that you've put your hope in seem to be falling apart, be truly, be truly glad because there is wonderful joy ahead. The best is yet to come. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. A little while meaning, you know, 70, 80, 90 years on this earth, whatever you got. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. The trials are important. They're good for you. They're gonna show you what you've put your hope in, where you've put your faith. They're gonna refine you, right? These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, 
Who needs it? I mean, Peter is unashamedly using a priceless inheritance in the most precious metal on earth, right? One of the most precious metals on earth, gold, to describe how important and how wonderful your faith and salvation and your hope resting in Christ are. He's using very practical, tangible things that we can all relate to to understand the wonderful joy that is ahead, even though for a little while on this earth, we're going to face trials. Now, I went down a rabbit hole this week researching this because, you know, of course, if you're a pastor and you're trying to preach the word, you're like, this is perfect. He's using a metaphor about how fire tests and purifies gold. I'm on chat GPT. I'm on Google. I'm researching the entire gold refining process. And I figured out, First off, that for a while, scientists have tried to see if we can humanly create gold. Is it possible for humans to make gold? Because it's hard to find, it's expensive. Turns out, we can make gold with a uh, particle accelerator. (laughs) This is wild. I came across this article in the BBC. Are y'all here for this? Like, this is, trust me, this is gonna blow your mind, okay? to create synthetic gold. So turns out gold is a finite resource. There's only so much of it on the planet. So they're like, well, maybe we can make some. And they realize, well, we could use a particle accelerator and blast atomic particles at other atomic particles and it would deconstruct whatever they're blasting the atoms at until it became a little bit of gold dust, okay? Now, to do that, first off, you have to have a particle accelerator which costs, and I quote, more than the entire space program of most nations. Secondly, is the energy yield problem, okay? Essentially, the amount of energy expended to synthesize gold is colossal in comparison to the amount of gold created, if they were to do this. One of the lead researchers of this project, they were seeing if they could make gold, Glenn Seaborg stated, it would cost more than, and I quote, $1 quadrillion per ounce. Gold is worth like like pure 24 karat gold. I looked it up. It's worth like 15 grand an ounce, okay? $1 quadrillion per ounce to produce gold with an atomic particle accelerator, okay? In other words, ain't gonna happen. The other option, if we want more gold, if we run out of gold on the Earth, well, uh, NASA and SpaceX are sending right now some sort of spacecraft to this asteroid that is a part of the planet Psyche 16 to see if they can mine gold from an asteroid in space. That's like an ocean of gold right there. That's pretty crazy. And then I was like, you should read that article. It's wild. I'm not gonna talk about it too much. They believe that Psyche 16, I think they're just making up numbers at this point. Like who, who comes up with this number? This is the number from the article. Is made up of at least 10,000 quadrillion. 10,000 quadrillion dollars worth of gold. Okay, there you go. That's how much gold is on that asteroid. Obviously, the cost and difficulty of getting gold off an asteroid is insane, so they're not gonna do it. Bottom line is this. Your faith, Peter is saying, your faith, which is more precious than gold, is tested and refined. Look, there, you can't go and get this anywhere else. You can't create this anywhere else. Your faith is your faith. It's not your parents. It's not your grandparents' faith. It is your personal faith with Jesus Christ. Literally, The deposit of faith in your heart, in your soul, is yours and yours alone. You can't go and get it from somewhere else, and you can't create it out of thin air. And it's so precious because it's the one thing that anchors you to the hope of Jesus Christ, to the life of Jesus Christ, so that you get the priceless inheritance of your salvation forever. Okay? Your faith is way more precious than mere gold. Gold stays here or gold floats off into space. Gold doesn't matter when you're looking at eternity, friends. Ain't nobody on their deathbed worried about their gold. They're worried about where am I going next? If they have some left over to leave to their family, great, that's beautiful, that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, What matters 
is what happens next, the inheritance that you receive for all eternity. That's what's important. Friends, all gold on planet Earth looks like this basically when it's mined out of the Earth. It looks like a rock. And the only way to extract the gold from all the impurities of this rock, there's, there's iron, there's dirt, there's clay, there's all sorts of things wrapped into this gold rock right here. The only way to extract it is to heat it up to its melting point of 1,947 degrees Fahrenheit. And here's the thing. Gold can become damaged or vaporized if it is overheated, even by a few degrees. Isn't that wild? Here's what you need to know. Whatever you're facing in life, whatever you've put your hopes and your dreams in that feels dead, that didn't work out the way that you hoped it would, whatever trial and storm you're in or you're headed into, you need to understand that God is refining faith in you, which is more precious than gold. And that refiner's fire, which is testing the faith inside of you, eventually becomes this. But only, only when it's been tested through trials. Only when your faith still clings to Christ, when it feels like everything else is falling apart. When every hope you had is no longer alive, but dead. Friends, what it means to live life in light of Easter, and this is the important thing, I'm closing with this so that the keys can come on out. Peter's writing to this group of Christians, the very first group of Christians, they love Jesus. It says, you love him even though you have never seen him, just like you and I. He said, your faith is beautiful. Your hope in Christ is beautiful. You didn't get the benefit of eating breakfast with Jesus like we did. You didn't get the benefit of running and seeing the empty tomb and then seeing him later in the upper room. You've just heard the good news and you've believed and now you're facing a trial. Now the things you've hoped in, they've died. Now all the things that you hoped would happen with your life, they didn't turn out the way they would and your faith is being tested and even though you don't see him now, he's not there with you physically in person, you are trusting him. You're trusting him and your faith is being purified by this fire and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. And the, roar, the reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Friends, please know this. God himself knows exactly, exactly what it takes to ultimately burn away the things in our life that will destroy us, hinder us, weigh us down, ruin the things that we care about most. Often, she's, we can be our own worst enemy. And God knows exactly how much heat to apply so that the, the pure gold of our faith, the pure gold of our hope will, will melt and sink below all the impurities and the impurities will be wiped away and only what is pure and true and good will remain. And so my, my call to you this morning as those who are living in light of the resurrection is anchor your hope in Jesus. Anchor your trust in the one that knows exactly how to care for you in such a way to set you free from yourself, to purify the most important things in your life, the things that will last for all eternity. Because he loves you, because he cares for you. And the things that will ultimately lead to the salvation of your souls forever. Amen? So friends, we're gonna close by taking communion together as we do every week. You can bring that out now. If you didn't get communion on your way in, it's just outside the doors. You can grab some now. But the beauty of Easter is Easter is still true today just as much as it was last Sunday. And our hope is secure. Our hope is anchored in the one that overcame the most hopeless situation imaginable, death itself. 
And so as we take communion now and we remember that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross, may your faith be anchored in him. May your hope be anchored in that. And may you experience inexpressible joy knowing that you are loved beyond anything you can imagine today. Let's take communion together in this moment.